why do we study the the host or the, the which is the human and why do we study the host genetic variation and that's because elements of the person that is infected might provide some clear clues to understanding the very different severity and outcome of individuals who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 or might indicate um, why some people get infected in the first place. And if we find those biological clues in the genome of the human, these might provide clues to effective ways in which we can develop a therapy or even preventive um, measures to intervene to develop medicines and vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 infection. And especially of interest would be clues that we get from human genetic variation where existing drugs might be reused, or as we say, repurposed for an effective defense or, or therapy against SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 disease. And we might also along the way identify groups of individuals in the population that might be at unusually high risk and need to be protected or might have an innate protection against infection from SARS-CoV-2. So why do we think this might be part of the picture? Well, there's a long history over the past decades of research into host genetics and response to infection. Um, some of the genetic risk factors that have been found, for example, a certain gene named CCR5 and HIV infection, describe mechanisms by which individuals are infected. And in the case of this particular mutation of the gene, CCR5, which is required for infection, individuals who are born with two defective copies of this gene essentially are completely prevented from being infected by certain strains of HIV. This gives us a very clear biological clue that we might go and mimic in developing a preventive medication for infection from HIV. This is not simply limited to HIV. We have many examples. For example, there's actually a very common and well-studied genetic mutation that has the same type of behavior. It's expressed on the surface of cells. And individuals who lack any functioning copy of this gene are actually completely protected from certain strains of norovirus infection. That sounds like a very, very good mutation if you have it. Now, at the same time, there's also many examples where the response of the immune system and the health of the person after infection is also governed by genetic variation. So, Bruce Walker, one of the leading HIV researchers over the past several decades, conducted a study some years ago that studied the genetic patterns in individuals who were infected with HIV, but over many years maintained without any medication a very low virus load and never progressed to AIDS. And in studying the genomes of those individuals compared with individuals who progressed to AIDS, they found, in fact, a very strong risk factor at a very predictable region of the genome, what's known as the, the HLA region. This is the region that governs your immune system's response to invaders of all kinds, and in fact is the region of the human genome that is typed to, un to understand tissue compatibility before transplantation. And together, the HLA and the CCR5 variation that I described explain nearly one quarter of the population variation how some people are infected and have a rapid progression to disease and why others were not infected even though they had the same, the same risk. Severity can also manifest itself in, in rare genetic syndromes. And there are now a number in the past years identified where individuals who are otherwise perfectly healthy have a rare genetic mutation that when they are exposed to what's a normal infection for most of us, such as influenza, they're developing a life-threatening complication. And so there's a track record of these kinds of genetic mutations as well. And so this was on our mind when in early March, at about the same time, I mean, Genzo was describing, his group was, was mobilizing to develop vaccine approaches. Um, we, as geneticists, um, began to think about opportunities. And Andrea has, has been the spearhead of the effort that I, I will describe to you briefly by launching first collaborations with many of his clinical genetics colleagues in Siena and in Northern Italy to study perhaps thousands of patients in a study that, that, that is just now maturing. 
um, Marco Sperla at the THL was a simultaneously developing a proposal within Finland to study COVID-19 patients from throughout Finland. And we began with our FinGen project that's based at FIM, but the partnership throughout all Finnish hospitals and biobanks to incorporate information from the National Infection Registry to see what individuals that we have already studied the genomes and the health history of would have been infected with COVID-19 and what were their outcomes. But we realized in, in a very short amount of thinking that this needed to be a global effort because no one study would be large enough. And we have immediately, and the first study that was, was done and, and released to the, to the public was from the FinGen project, where we've now studied 250 individuals who were identified as having COVID-19 in the National Infection Registry from the almost 100 times or 1,000 times more Finns that have been enrolled in the FinGen project. And this was not a large enough study by itself to make any genetic progress, but it helped us to think about how we would go out and reach out to the world to begin the process of doing a more definitive and informative genetic study of a global nature, because this was a global challenge and not one that was at all specific or necessarily that severe in Finland. So we had to think about how to develop a global initiative that would be able to mobilize and immediately start working in real time. Because the general history of, of, of you know, research in general and research in our field of, of genetics and biology in particular is that these things take years and years to come together. And so we wanted to immediately launch work both in a centralized way across all studies in the world to join a simple collective study, but then also to promote individual groups to look into more detailed specialized data types and technical expertise um, to study things that only a few groups might work. So here we would develop an initiative that would both do centralized things, but also serve as a network to connect people. And there are many different types of studies that need to be integrated. This is really the main challenge to doing a global study because there are clinical studies and rapid response studies in hospitals. There are existing biobanks such as Fugen and many other studies, in, in fact, direct to consumer genetics companies like Ancestry and 23andMe are beginning to do studies. And how we put those together and harmonize into some simple activities to study the severity of individuals with COVID-19 response versus mild cases, and then to study susceptibility by looking at all cases versus the remainder of the population, took some time to come together, but they have begun to, to do so. And so in, in mid-March, we launched with, with Andrea's Great Energy COVID-19 um, uh, initiative, which you can go to this website and, and see more about, but it has already grown to more than 150 studies and more than 1,100 scientists around the world participating in the activity. Um, and the, the, the real driving motivation was that we would do global genetic studies with as many partners as possible and make the results immediately publicly available so that every researcher in the world, in pharmaceutical industry, in universities throughout the world, in hospitals throughout the world would have access to the information as soon as we generated it. And so in May 15th, we put out the first analysis from this. Instead of now 250 only from FinGen, we combined with many other studies, got already to 1,600 cases, did not have a completely definitive set of answers but had some very strong clues. And what was quite interesting was then last week, another group um, that has now contributed the data to this initiative described a study with almost 2000 cases. And in fact, these two studies pinpointed exactly the same genetic variation on chromosome three. And the odds of this happening is roughly one in one million, million, million to one. And so, as a result, we conclude that immediately, as of last week, we have already identified the first hit for COVID-19 susceptibility. And it's in a very interesting region of chromosome three that involves both a gene which is a partner to ACE2, the receptor for um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and also, in fact, a number of chemokine receptors similar to that CCR5 gene. There's also a second hit described in these studies, which corresponds to linkage to 
um, ABO blood type in which individuals with type O have a slight protection compared to individuals with other blood types. Um, and this is an image taken from the 23andMe blog. And so I want to leave you with the idea that this is really the first beginnings of, of uh, discovery, that there is much, much more to come from this activity as it grows from a few hundred to a few thousand to over the summer, more than 10,000 cases expected. Um, but that in three months, we've managed to launch an entire global initiative, get more than a thousand scientists to sign on to it, and have already made the first conclusive links to genetic susceptibility and severity, which are now eagerly being followed up by researchers around the world. So thanks very much, and thanks especially to my colleague Andrea Gama at FIM, who has been driving this effort um, on behalf of not only our own FIM and high life efforts, but on behalf of the entire world to try to generate information that can make a difference in the development of therapies and vaccines in the very near future. So uh, there was this question about um, uh, about the long-term symptoms of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so are there any uh, studies going on uh, about uh, how severe these long-term symptoms are and are there coming any treatments for those? Because some there are many people who are suffering, uh, for example, several months long uh, diseases afterwards. Yes, absolutely. Yes. No, these have been launched. This is a very good question. And, and these studies have been launched. And, and one of the focuses of the, uh, of the consortium on the longer term basis will be to and continue the engagement with all of the research groups participating right now to do that follow-up work because I think this is something that has been very much overlooked in the in the public health discussions about you know where should we have herd immunity or should everyone wear masks and these types of things is that it's not simply that you know young people would get sick and then recover there is very likely some long-term medical consequences that come from infection and that this you know, needs to be studied and understood. And, and uh, this is a very important long-term goal of the, the consortium activity, which we will be well um, situated to study. Uh, we have another question. Um, a person is asking, as a hematopathologist, uh, I am suspecting the link be between vitamin B12 level and the severity of COVID-19 because the vitamin B level has a crucial ro a role in immune system function. Have you heard uh, any uh, research about the dem uh, that could demonstrate uh, such a link? Um, we, have we have mechanisms in place in the genetic study to be able to ask this question. And the way that it works is that when there are known genetic variants that in the general population influence the vitamin B levels, we can then take those forward and examine whether in those in particular play a role in COVID-19. And that gives us then a very direct clue that that might be playing a role. So this is something that the study is not yet large enough to, to have any definitive answer about, but it will be over the upcoming months. I think it's a very good hypothesis. Um, you mentioned uh, in your speech about this, um, for example, blood types that uh, and other uh, issues that uh, can give some immune immunity uh, for the uh, COVID-19. Uh, how strong these immunities can be? So the you know the the blood type by itself is not a major you know uh, you know it, it is not a, a sort of a black and white factor of of, of risk. It's uh, you know as it showed it was about three percent of exposed individuals with the O blood type and four percent with the non O blood type were showing symptoms of of infection. Um, but uh, you know, combined, I think one of the things that we we can begin to see is that when we combine these risk factors from different regions of the genome, different chromosomes, um, we can see you know individuals at one end that are highly protected and individuals at the other end that are at higher risk, and those might that might provide opportunities to study what else is is different in the biology of those individuals that might give them further clues. But at this point, the genetics don't tell that some people are at very high risk or very low risk. But again, 
the, the study is still very, very early. And I think these first two genetic discoveries that came only last week um, need a lot of work to be fully understood. Okay. Hey, thank you, Mark.